Good morning, Northfield Church. That's what you say here, right? Good morning. <laughs> it is such a pleasure to be able to join you. I'm going to fix this microphone. There, I think that'll be better. It's such a pleasure to be able to join you this morning. And you wouldn't know, but Connecticut really is my spiritual home. Strange, in a way, because I grew up in Washington, D.C., lived in the same house for all of my life until I went off to college in Philadelphia. But to the extent that I ever went to church, it was in Connecticut. My parents are not religious people. My mother is a preacher's kid. You know what happens with preachers. Maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> but many preacher's kids. And, and she just wound up not having very much interest in the church. My father is an atheist. But they're wonderful people who instilled important values in me. But when I came to visit my grandfather, that preacher, in New Haven, he was the one who really introduced me to the Christian faith. And eventually, by the age of 12, it was there in New Haven that I was baptized. I wound, I wound up asking for it after my grandmother sort of nudged me towards it. And she said, Kaji, and to me and my cousin Talia, she said, girls, it's time you get done. And we said, well, what is that? So in conversation with my granddad, we learned about this beautiful tradition in the Christian faith in which we have this sense of cleansing, clearing out, of inviting a special form of lifelong grace. And that's precisely, look at the connection, what John the Baptist was doing for people in the wilderness, pre-Christ, I mean, pre the time of Jesus' ministry, in preparation. And so I think about this, Connecticut, my spiritual home, and it just feels like such a wonderful homecoming to be here on this Sunday morning. I haven't been here in a while, and the first time I ever came was actually with Ellen, who um, led the St. Cecilia Mass. And this was early in my singing career, when the only solo I could sing was Happy Birthday. I don't know why she would remember that, but later on I actually became a much more serious singer. But that was early and introduced me much to the choral tradition that became so dear and near to my heart. So, again, I'm just really grateful to be able to be here this morning. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. John the Baptist's baptism, his baptism of repentance, was a beautiful introduction that sort of set the way for Jesus' ministry. How? This sort of clearing up. And we remember it always during Advent, particularly on the second Sunday of Advent, this time of the new year, because this is the time that we prepare. I think you probably just hung the greens in the church. You start to hang up the lights in your own houses. Maybe you start listening to Christmas music a little before Christmas. I'm okay with that. But Advent is this wonderful time of, of some, something like a house cleaning, in which we take a look at those things that are in our lives that might stand in the way of recognizing the face of Christ when it's met with us, that might keep us from being able to take a deep breath and experience the grace of the Holy Spirit, that might make us suspicious or angry or even start to ignore the voice of God that speaks to us through all kinds of forms of grace. And so when John the Baptist came, and this, he's kind of a crazy figure. I mean, he's out there like wearing what not, not what normal people would wear, like a sort of odd outfit of almost nothing. And he's eating locusts and honey, and he's out there proclaiming this bizarre sort of form of repentance that went far beyond what people were doing at the time. What he was offering was something new heralding a new time when we could then begin to cleanse, begin to do something different, and welcome Christ in a new way. Now, a lot of us have heard of our faith lives referred to as something of a journey, as if we're on a road. And as we walk this road, there may be things, um, brambles, there may be things that would have us fall, there may be moments that would make us feel as if we were not connected to the deepest parts of our spiritual longings. It can be on our spiritual journey that we, we feel that we can't sense the presence of God. And in these, in these 
yearnings, in these moments in which we go on our journeys. What John wants us to do is to turn. That's what repentance means. It means a turning back towards God, which isn't to say that God isn't facing in whatever direction we look. It is to say that what we're doing is acknowledging that as we turn, we're turning, turning to God. That's repentance. It's not what so many people would have us think, that it's a way of feeling guilty. It's not a way of making us feel anxious. It's not a way of someone having control over our access to God. It's a way of saying, no, God is right there, waiting for you, ready to open up God's arms to you. Now, a lot of us think when we're on this walk, on this journey, on this Christian path, that as we walk, we're headed towards the God who sits, who sits or stands at the end of the road with arms wide open. And that's a beautiful image. Is that familiar? The trouble, and I agree with that, but the trouble with thinking of God only in that way is that we might think that this road only has God at the end and that God isn't there with us all along it. And what John the Baptist does is he so beautifully places God on our path, right there with us. And that is different. That's a new form of the ministry he's offering. So not that long ago, I was uh, doing some research on my name, Kaji, which is not the most usual name. And apparently it has many meanings in Japanese. It can mean fire, which is appropriate, because I have a bit of a fiery personality. But it also can mean housekeeping, which is interesting. <laughs> And it can mean the transfer of energy, the beautiful transfer of energy that gives someone um, the power of spirit, which I really like. So I was talking to my friends about this, and most of my friends have much more common names like Bob and Paul, and etc. And one of my friends, John, said, you know, I haven't really done all that much research in my name, but all I know is that John is a receptacle of <laughs> going to the John, etc. So he felt bad that my name had all these wonderful meanings and his was uh, maybe a little bit less powerful. I felt bad for poor John, and I figured that any time the name, any name comes up in the Bible, it has meaning. And I knew about John the Baptist. I also knew about John, the writer of the gospel and so forth. So I said, John can't possibly just mean that John. <laughs> And I did some research, and what I found, is there anyone here named John, by the way? Oh, of course, yeah, so there's a John there, of course, John Rogers. So, um, what I found is that John means God is gracious. And how interesting, right? So the name means God is gracious, and here you've got this nutcase out in the wilderness eating locusts and honey, Proclaiming something nobody really wanted to hear of repentance and sometimes calling people a bird of vipers. Not exactly the most friendly guy. But he's out there telling people, repent, repent, repent. The kingdom of God is at hand. But the man's name means God is gracious. And that's very interesting. And it's an important lesson in this time of preparation, in this time of cleansing, in this time of repentance to remember that whenever judgment is talked about in the Bible, whenever you hear somebody saying, turn away from this way you're doing things, or repent, or uh, confess, it's never meant to make you feel bad. What it's meant to do is to remind you uh, that God is gracious. That grace can break through no matter what we do. That grace is so overwhelming and so powerful and so beautiful that no matter where we turn, it's ready to be there when we want to look. God is gracious. Now, that grace doesn't depend on us, but what John's saying as John situates God on the walk, on the road, is that we do have a role we can play in how we experience grace. Because remember, what John says is, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. And what does that mean? What can it mean to make a path straight? What could we do to make the experience of the road something different, so that God has the space to do God's work and for us to be able to recognize it? 
I imagine you all have ideas, and a lot of it has to do with what we talked about here with our guests here this morning. It has to do with remembering that we're never on this road alone. Every bit of God's creation shares it with us. Every bit of God's creation from the beginning of time has been on that road, making the preparations for us to step in this path. And as we walk in the footsteps of Jesus, we too have things that we can do to prepare the road for those who will come behind us. Our children, for example. What world do we live, leave them with? What will the state of the air be? Will they have the resources they will need to be able to thrive? Will they be able to learn and grow and live safely? Of course, these are not just questions of how, um, of how we prepare our own lives, but how we prepare the road to be safer for others. I was just walking down the street in New York City the other day while I was thinking about this sermon. And um, if you've ever walked down the street in Manhattan, what you know is that you've got to kind of um, have this tricky balance of looking down so that you don't step on something you don't want to step on. But also, you want to look up so that you can see people. And so it's a, it's a funny thing. And when I forget to look down, something bad always happens. But the problem is that if you're always walking like this, if you're always hunched over, if you're always wondering what it is that's going to get in your way and what pothole you're going to step in, or what's going to, you know, have you fall off the road, if you don't have people helping, preparing the space, caring for the place in which you will be, then that experience keeps you from being able to keep your head up and experience the grace of God and see Remember, we're created in God's image, which means that each of us reflects the face of Christ. And if you're looking down here, then how are you going to get to see the ways in which each person here is reflecting the face of Christ? Preparing the way of the Lord, making God's path straight, making the road a better road for the rest of the folks to walk on who come after us, is all about recognizing God in our midst. Seeing God in the other, helping us to be able to see each other for the beautiful, gracious beings, for God is gracious, the beautiful, gracious beings that we are. God blesses us no matter what we do, no matter where we turn. Those outstretched arms are not just at the end of the road, the road which has no end, but they embrace us in the loving arms of our neighbors, in the embrace of love, in the kiss of our child, in the beautiful sense of community that we create in spaces like this. And so as we come together and as we head towards Christmas, that time of celebration where we see the gorgeous and everlasting light, may we but prepare the way anew figure out what's next, what's the next step. We help refugees. How do we make systems that support them even more? Right, what's the next step. Consider what's next in your own life. What needs to be cleared away? What boulder can you shove aside so that someone can traverse the path a little better? I myself will be considering this as my advent preparations. And I would love to hear whatever might come as you consider the same. And throughout all of it, we know that God is on that road with us, blessing every second of the way. Amen?